Um, our sector has shown its agility, flexibility and resilience in the last six months. We have learned to manage and cope with the challenges that COVID-19 has thrown at us, both on a personal and business level. And we are very fortunate today to have three speakers from the north, the south and west of Wales who are ready to share their learnings and present how they've managed uh, the challenge and also to answer your questions. We aim for the session to last no more than 45 minutes. So if we are unable to answer, answer any of your questions on the list, we will collate them and publish them together with the answers and a recording of the session um, on our Food Innovation Wales website, which I will discuss a little bit later on. So here is the agenda, and, and this is basically the, the, run, the running order today. Um, so the first presentation um, will be completed by um, Gareth Snook, who is the Head of Technical for FEI Foods. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gareth Snook. I'm Head of Technical at FEI Foods. First and foremost, a huge thank you to Helen, Rhiannon and the team for organising this session and inviting me to take part. Uh, FEI Foods, we're a manufacturer of rice and grain products in, in retortable pouches. We have a factory in, in Swansea and another one uh, just as Cardiff in, in Land Trissant. Uh, I just want to take the opportunity to take the last six months or so through, through our coronavirus sort of journey uh, and the challenges that we, we have faced. So that's with the uh, majority of us, sort of in early January, we were fairly relaxed about it, about it all. So uh, the message coming out from the government was that it was all in control and it wasn't going to be that much of an issue. But when, when it became sort of that global pandemic and more and more cases throughout Europe and then the UK, it being, became clear that, that it was going to become um, more of an issue um, for, for us here, here in, in the UK and the food industry. So just you know, before lockdown, what was the sort of thing? So as I said, in January, we were talking about the things, but it was, it was more in and around sort of how a rise in scanning, where are our ingredients coming from, are we going to have shortages? Uh, we were going to ask from, from all of our customers these sort of questions. So um, that, was, that was the line of our sort of inquiries. Uh, it wasn't until sort of, sort of March that we pulled our crisis team together and said, right now, what are we going to do? Um, first and foremost, we pointed things like a single, single um, point of contact for anyone with COVID symptoms. That was really important to make sure we had a consistent approach. Um, so, so one manager wasn't telling them one thing and one manager wasn't telling the employee another thing. It was the same person day in, day out, ensuring that, uh, that they had um, COVID symptoms and instructing them what, what they should be, should be doing uh, and when they were expected to return to work. Uh, letters were sent out to everyone to inform them of things like shielding, full briefings in, in dual language was obviously really important. It's not something we would normally do. We do, in, do operate in English, but we felt it was such an important um, scenario that, that we want to ensure that um, uh, the majority of our Polish workers, especially in Swansea, um, had clear understanding of, of, of what the situation was and, and their expectations. Uh, with things like um, done a full risk assessment of, of site um, uh, and place clear screens in between workers where, where possible. So where social distancing was a possible things like packing lines, you know, we, we did actually put in, put in screens in between, in between people, similar to like you see in supermarkets and that. So afterwards, other, other actions that we started putting in through as we went into March and April, so we did things like stack at start and time, finish time, so, so the outgoing shift would finish at, at 5.30, um, get them all off shift, and then we would bring the new shift in to make sure there was no sort of intermingling. Uh, where we could put screens, um, we, we, we gave visors to people, we sort of a, a screen in between people, so we had some roles that involved two people, so it was that, um, that, we, that we did that. Uh, lots of signage. We removed things like smoking shelter in, in before and after the first hour of shift because we, we found that there was a lot of congregation between staff at the start of shift, for example, uh, or even at the end of shift. So we, we took that out of the, out the equation. We removed fingerprint recognition. So obviously that's a major touch point. So we removed that um, and just went manually. And we employed four sanitizers, so one, one per shift with nothing of apart from go around all of the different um, frequent touch points and, and sanitize them. And that's still in place now. Uh, we we stopped cross-site cross, cross -site travel uh, and 
non-essential workers were, were working from home, um, et cetera. They removed things like strip curtains, the frequent touch points, hard to clean, um, and open doors. So all of this with it with a sort of trying not to sort of compromise food safety at the same time. It was like that constant battle of food safety comp compromise, which you can't make versus sort of health and safety and the, and the well-being of, of our staff. So as May went, as went into May, so other things that, we, that, we, that we've done, so we, we introduced temperature scanning within our security huts. So as more and more people were coming back into site, so we had new equipment that we just had to bring in, people from Denmark and, and from France, that we just had to bring them in to sort of commission this new equipment. More and more people bringing in, uh, we, we put this temperature scan just as an added, added sort of um, barrier. Uh, return to work forms for holidays, that was really important. Um, a change in which we did we now bring facial recognition on for, for operators so so it now um, clocks them in clocks them out but it's all to do with facial recognition and temperature scanning at the same time um, mandatory face masks issue, issue them out we do call covid swabbing uh, very high traffic points throughout throughout a factory so we started that um, last month um, we'll continue to do that um, at, at both sites on, on a monthly basis now just to ensure that due diligence um, and things like sanitizer push pads. Um, I don't know if you guys, anyone's seen them, but there's pads that you can get to, to put on the doors. You can get ones on handles as well. So we, we've introduced a lot of those. Um, they are quite costly, but we find that they've been very, very effective. And tools for communication, things like wireless headsets and, and radios to prevent people uh, removing masks to talk or, or shouting across the lines. Uh, it was important that we gave them the tools to be able to communicate um, easily whilst, uh, whilst on, a, on a noisy, busy factory floor. So our main challenges that we, that we sort of faced um, from, from outside, it was things like testing availability. First few months, lack of testing availability was a real problem. So at peak, we had over 40, um, 40 uh, employees that were self-isolating uh, and we were really reliant on, on sort of casual labor as a result because we, we needed to continue to, to service the orders that were coming through the door at an increasingly high level. Um, and that just increased the risk. The more casual labor you bring in, the higher the, higher the risk. So um, we, we did purchase antibody tests. So now if anyone come back into the business, we were allowing them to, to, to do an antibody test. And, and actually sort of, I would say approximately 1% um, of those that have been off self-isolating actually came back with a, a positive antibody test. So it, it's, it's very low, but it was, it was just something that we, we, we thought was a good tool to have to, to sort of help steer our food to strategy. Uh, lack of basic PPE, chemical availability, we all would have found that, that to try and get hold of things was very, very difficult. Um, panic buying was a problem because our, our, our orders just went through the roof from the end of February all the way through to probably May, we had our busiest, busiest two, three months on, on record. So that was, that was a problem. Uh, and sort of key absences, so things like engineering departments that we, uh, you know, it probably wasn't coronavirus, but a bug would have gone through, through um, a shift of, of engineers and, and you end up with no engineers on shift. Similarly, within, within technical, at one point in one of the factories, I had one person that was, that was fit and well, all the rest were, were isolating, um, which was the right thing to do, but it obviously is, is, a, is a challenge. So things that were internal that was difficult, it was, um, it was all compliance and social distancing was, was a problem. Um, you, you, you tell staff until you're blue in the face, but unfortunately they, they creep together. And even, even myself, when on the shop floor, you'd find yourself slowly, slowly, slowly getting to within past that two meters. It's just natural. You can't, you can't help yourself because it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a change in which, the, which way, way we work. Um, so we, we, we had to bring in mandatory masks um, because of that. Um, complacency, but again, what that is, you'd find, you'd find you'd, you'd bring in the rules and, and very, very quick, not very quickly, but over, over, over a period of weeks, those rules would slowly, slowly sort of um, not be flaunted, but be forgotten, so you'd have to reinforce them. Car sharing was, was an issue. Um, many, many employees share cars to and from work. Um, so outside of work was, was a problem. We can only control what we can control. Um, outside of work is, is, was a risk and maintains to be a risk. And employees 
believe in what they what they read on the internet. So it was oh, masks are no good. Um, uh, two meter rule is 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 no good. Um, they rather believe what they, what they would read rather than what the government was telling them or we were telling them. Um, how we interacted with other businesses. So we made you know contact with the EHO. We spoke to them. They were happy with what we were doing. We've had contact with the H HSE. All this over the telephone. We've proactively done our BRC extensions. We've had, since in July, we've had a Tesco audit. It was all announced. We've had an unannounced audit from, from one of our other customers, which was, was slightly naughty at the time. But, but we, we, got, we got through. We allowed them in. We did, we did think about it. We did allow them in. Um, but hopefully that will be the only unannounced. Um, yeah, all other orders have been planned in and announced, which I think is the right thing to do for, for the time being. So as we get back to more normality, so more and more people are back in the office now. So we've got mandatory cleaning of desks before and after, so the cleaning stations. Um, work from was still in place, but rotation around the office. And we're still using things like um, Microsoft Teams as, as for day-to-day -day -day meetings rather than being in, in big offices, even if we are in, in our own offices, each, each in a different office within, within the, uh, the same premises. It just works. I think it will continue to work. What would we do differently? I think I would introduce managing face coverings sooner, um, but we didn't want to do that without sort of being sure of our supply, and that was important, but I would like to have done it sooner. Um, we'd like to engage the workforce sooner as well. Um, it was, we, we did hold staff forums. We were worried about doing that first and foremost, but once we did it, it was, we felt it was really, really a good step forward because it, it made them feel as though that they were made them part of the decision making um, and it made us be able to get our message onto the shop floor so communication was, was a big thing so what concerns have i got for the future so as we go into sort of the autumn and winter are we going to have access to um to uh, or control of the testing speedy turnaround so it would be really good as a business so rather than rely on operators to tell oh i'm trying to get a test or i haven't got a test is there some we can control that as a business, or we can put our our staff forward for testing? Is there proactive testing that we can that we can be doing? Because uh, something like a track and trace could completely um, completely decimate a whole shift. Um, the, uh, localized lockdowns, what would that mean? Um, shielding, will that have to come back in? Uh, and yeah, as we grow, we have to bring more and more people into our into our business. So. Yeah, so thank you for your time. I'm sure if you've got any questions, you can forward them on to, um, to uh, uh, Rhiannon and Helen and the, and the team and they will forward them on. All right, thanks. Thank you, Gareth, uh, for sharing the details of how FEI Foods have implemented their COVID-19 controls. I'm sure you, the attendees will all have questions for you a bit later. Um, okay, on to our next speaker. Um, this is um, a gentleman called Steve Meek uh, from a company of he uh, from Rowan Foods, and he is the head of technical. Over to you, Steve. Hi, my name is Steve Meek. I've been at Rowan Foods for 26 years working in technical, and I've agreed to tell you about COVID, how COVID affected us. Probably one of the biggest challenges that we've all faced. I intend to cover a brief introduction about Rome Foods related to COVID to put it into context. I'll describe the approach to COVID-19 that we took and why we took it. Look at, the, look at what controls introduced at lockdown and then improvements we made as more information and guidance became available. I'll describe what happened, the consequences when the outbreak hit the factory. And finally, we'll discuss briefly some of the challenges and learnings that we have taken from it all. A bit of background to our business before we start. <laughs> We're based on Wrexham Industrial Estate, three miles from Wrexham, with poor public transport links and employ up to 1,500 people, mainly from the town. Car sharing has actively been promoted as part of our environmental drive. We operate 24-7 with 13 labour-intensive production lines, producing approximately 2 million chilled ready meals a week. We employ some agency workers, all from a dedicated provider. Have a large European contingency, many living close together in Wrexham and many whole family members employed. So what was our approach? On, on day one, we set up a group daily COVID meeting to agree best practices across the sites, did the normal technical thing and carried out a risk assessment. 
Like most people, invested heavily in physical measures, screens, visors, canteen alterations. We communicated with Environment Health, our social distancing plan, on day one and continued to communicate throughout. Communicated with the police over car sharing on day one and how best to manage, as there were some real concerns from colleagues about being stopped and fined. We followed government guidelines as our mantra, as many mixed messages with conflicting advice. So what were the measures that we introduced at lockdown? All staff who could work from home did, 14 permanently and 36 rotated, with only direct manufacturing supervision and management not doing so. 30 people furloughed to enable them to shield or self-isolate. Only business critical visitors allowed onto site. Line manning levels reduced by running slow for complex products and some even delisted. Shift times changed to reduce the number of staff arriving and leaving site at any one time. Additional sanitizing points were put in place throughout the site. Doors through the site were held open or removed where possible to reduce contact. Guidance on, on safe car sharing and any associated risk of, for, for staff was communicated. Staff guidance documents were put up in canteen and all walls. Additional return to work checks were introduced. Corridors were all marked out with distance markers. Six dedicated social distance champion introduced in all areas with no other responsibilities. They generated distance observations and numbers reported, a version on behavioral health and safety. Screen on assembly line in lines introduced where two meters was just simply impossible. Bagging of coats was introduced. We'll probably keep this going even when COVID has long gone. The canteen was opened up, distance markers on floor, one-way system, car payments, and every other seat used. An overflow canta canteen consisting of a marquee in the yard was introduced together with increased smoking area with floor signage and a separate vaping area. We purchased a thousand visors which were offered to all colleagues who wanted them. It didn't stop there, so new information resulted in further improvements. A monthly letter to all staff from which our site manager helped update and guide behaviour. The canteen was made non-self-service and a screen put up in place around the serving area. A one-way system was introduced in the Harris Change Room as our most challenging area. All office desks had Perspex device introduced. COVID process flow diagrams for every product introduced for best assembly positioning with sign-offs by line leaders. All meetings moved to Microsoft Teams where two meter distances could not be achieved. The taste panel room was revamped with screens and access limited. Fogging in the factory was increased to reduce virus levels in the environment. Additional cleaning of key touch points, e.g. handrails, and swabbing to verify clean. The social distancing team were put on a rotor to cover all areas and shifts. We introduced contact tracing ahead of the government scheme. Continuous temperature monitoring introduced as colleagues enter the canteen. COVID swabbing of key touch points completed with all negative. We, we allowed Welsh government advice and introduced isolation pay. So a few examples in photographs, canteen was made non-self-service as you can see here. Changing room practices were further improved. Office desks with Perspex divides introduced. Assembly plan set up for 200 products. QA panel room was revamped. Factory screen was roll, screening was rolled out. And we had highly visible social distance champions as you can see here. So what happened? Well, we started okay with no cases. Floors have everything in place. Our site based in London has several cases long before us, but before contact tracing was enacted. Then two people tested positive. The weak widespread testing was made available. Immediately completed track and trace system and within three weeks, 41 people positive. Positive cases were spread randomly across factory and offices with many family members and car sharing links. Public Health Wales decided to send the army in and test everyone, 1,500 people. Mass testing resulted in another 268 cases. Over 50% of the positive results, the individual was showing absolutely no sign of COVID at all. Challenge of trying to test 1,500 people at, at once caused results not to be communicated quickly enough to isolate people correctly. Positive cases resulted in track and trace with isolations and more testing. Absence went to 25%. Local environmental health were extremely supportive by they identified clusters of cases centered around the international community of Wrexham. A HSE two-day visit was organized by Public Health Wales, which concluded we were doing everything practical to control the virus, and the root cause of the outbreak was not likely to be the factory. We now have no positive cases and the outbreak is closed. 
it was concluded that the root cause of the outbreak was communities not following social distancing measures. We had nobody hospitalised due to COVID. So what were the key challenges? First of all, just getting 150 people in and out of high risk in a timely and COVID safe way at change, shift changeover. The shift times changed health, but didn't completely resolve the problem. Managing what follow, following the two meter rule, what, wherever practical meant, as colleagues just simply struggled to understand this. Managing car sharing when we'd done so much to promote it previously. Ensuring all our colleagues had accurate information when so much inaccurate information on social media. Dealing with contradictory advice on such things as face covering, temperature monitoring. So what are the key learnings? First of all, employing six dedicated social distancing champions was effective and showed everyone that we were taking it seriously. Social distancing champions are a great way to, in, to change behavior and plan to use for other behavior changes we want to enact. Using symptoms to prevent the spread of, of the virus was simply not effective. Talking to the local environmental health from day one really helped ensure we had up-to-date information on the best practices. We should have got more involved in the mass testing as the army did not have the appropriate skills to ensure information was accurate. Consequently, many people never got their results, including me. Working with the environmental health on the track and trace meant it could be completed more effectively as we had better access to the people and appropriate interpreters for our non-English speaking colleagues. We should have had more communication with our works council having, prior to having any cases. We moved to weekly when, when the first case happened. Our colleagues were fantastic despite large number of cases and the external pressures, meaning we kept the business going and, and came out stronger than we went into it. The more you test, the more positives you get. So in summary, this was new to everyone, so nobody knew what to do. The mantra of following the guidance helped us. Introducing social distance champion, champions was critical to changing behavior and showing our people and external bodies that we're doing everything possible to meet the guidelines. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Steve, for a comprehensive overview of the controls you've implemented. Um, some interesting perspectives there for us all to think about and hopefully that will stimulate a few more questions uh, from all attendees. Um, our final presentation today is from John O'Farrell who is the Operations Director of uh, Key Cal on Cymru and he's based in West Wales and we are very fortunate that John agreed to share his learnings and his ideas with us um, at short notice. And my colleague Rhiannon spent some time asking him and interviewing and talking to him about how COVID-19 has impacted the business. So um, yeah, let's, let's listen to what John's uh, perspective is on COVID-19. Thank you, John. Um, good afternoon, um, John, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us um, as part of this Food Innovation event, Food Innovation Wales event. Could you just give us a brief introduction to your business? Good afternoon, Rhiannon. Um, our business is a beef abattoir business in Crosshands, West Wales. We're, I suppose, small to medium in size. We slaughter about 600 predominantly local uh, livestock uh, have a staff of 65, 70 on our books, and um, we work traditionally Monday to Friday is our traditional week, seven to four. Okay, great. So I'm just going to ask you a series of questions about how your business has um, sort of handled the challenges of um, COVID since the outbreak of the pandemic in March. So. Um, the first question, what, what have been your, your key learnings for the business in relation to COVID um, since the start of the pandemic? Well, we're one of the most regulated businesses in the world, the food industry. So generally speaking, we take our instructions from outside. In this situation in March, there wasn't an awful lot of information available. We were all in this for the first time. Um, I suppose the first thing we did was look at TASIP and we did a threat analysis right across our site. I suppose it, we had experience, majority of us in this business because we come from livestock. And coming from livestock, we're well used of coronavirus in calves, etc., etc., over the years. So good practice with livestock 
ended up being good practice on the site. And uh, that might sound strange, but it's not really. It's exactly the same criteria you work, we would work to, as we would in, in a calf rearing operation. Um, so our TASF immediately was based around where the cross-contamination points are and where people were meeting. So in general, our first thing we did was to try and see could we divide our team into two. Mm -hmm. If we did get an outbreak, it would be in team A, but not in team B. Yeah. We split our canteen into two. We set up a second canteen. We did the same with our toilet facilities. We did the same with our farmers and introduced outside mobile toilets for them and for all our hauliers coming in. We decided early on to bring in temperature checking on the gate. And the reason for that is to try and reassure. Because when your temperature is taken every morning and you know your temperature is 36.2, in my case, and it's the same every morning, and when it drops to 35.9, you know that as well. We felt that that would mean that our staff in general felt we were controlling, and controlling the entry points was extremely important to us. We went for zero visitors, absolutely nobody on site. Again, any points of crossover from entering the site and pressing the buttons to get let, let, let you in to using a machine a card machine to pay for product we done away with yep. we, left, we left it open we tried anything and everything to reduce any points of contact increased our ppe right across the site introduced visors which didn't work um the guys found them impossible to work with um we adhere to the two meter rule to the point that we actually marked the concrete outside and put circles where everyone was to stand on the entry points going in. It basically was a team effort and bringing everybody on board with it. Um, majority of the guys were finding that their, their friends and neighbours were furloughed and furloughed created its own problems in that these these guys were being asked to come in and their neighbours were at home safe with their families. So it was a, a mammoth task to make certain that they felt safe. Yeah, it sounds like you did a lot within your business to support that. Um, leading on to my next question, um, what do you see as the key challenges to um, meat slaughter and processing plants going into the winter period now and with um, localised lockdown in Wales? Well, it hasn't really changed since March, because looking at it currently, it looks like we're going to have the second round. The biggest difference this time was the weather was very favourable to us in March and April, and was actually wonderful. This time, we have wet weather, cold weather on the way. That's going to be a huge challenge. The first thing we're doing as a business is we've paid for ourselves to vaccinate all our staff for the flu. Um, we just feel it's necessary to do. Um, we don't feel that we should walk away from our responsibility. We basically are getting everybody the flu vaccine jab immediately. Um, after that, it's basically continuing what we've done all spring. No visitors, PPE, any place we feel that there's a risk, try to reduce it. Um, as many as possible that can work from home, will work from home. And again, try and keep our team into two groups. So if we get it in group A, we hopefully have a group B. I would ask if at all possible the possibility of testing, because at the moment, uh, that seems to be still an area that's not really that possible for food factories to get. And I, what I mean by testing is if we do have, unfortunately, somebody with it, and so far we've, we've been lucky we haven't, that all the site will be tested. And that yep. will be brilliant going forward. Okay. Well, thank you very much for taking um, part in this Food Innovation Wales event and for your time. Thank you very much, Brianna. So thank you uh, to all our speakers who have shared their insights into embedding COVID-19 control measures into their businesses. 
uh, you know, I invite you all to post any questions you may have for the panel um, prior to our Q&A and um, I will be asking Rhiannon to, to collect them. So while you're doing that, I wanted to share a resource uh, that Food Innovation Wales team has pulled together from multiple resources, discussions with industry and working with businesses. It's our um, COVID-19 toolkit, which can be found on our Food Innovation Wales website. This is a screenshot of it. Um, we review and update the toolkit on a regular basis and aim to use this approach uh, for future um, sort of information and updates. The technical group meet regularly. We first published this on the 7th of April 2020. Um, there are currently 27 documents um, in, the, in the system with useful links. Um, of course, the important thing for us is that the industry use them, they're practical and applied. Currently, uh, this particular um, sort of part of the website has been accessed and the toolkit has been accessed over 5,000 times. Um, so I've put a little link there on the bottom of the screen for your information. Um, so if you want to uh, look into it further, you can. Okay, we now move on to the Q&A uh, part of our session and I've asked Rhiannon uh, to facilitate this. Thank you, Rhiannon. Um, hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, Gareth, I've got a couple of questions first, so is it possible you could unmute your microphone please? There you go. Afternoon everyone. Afternoon, so Gareth, um, if you don't mind, the first question. Um, you talked in your presentation about um, the COVID swabbing that had been implemented. Um, could you just go into a bit more detail please about sort of like um, hotspots frequency and how it works in general within the factory environment please? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I'm sure the, most of your labs will be able to provide these now. So um, our lab um, were able to probably about two, three months ago. Um, so what we did, we identified our, our sort of high frequency points anyway, as part of our sanitation program. Um, and we had those individuals cleaning those areas. But on top of that, then we, we sort of just went through just sort of, sort of basic risk assessment to say, which piece of equipment or which door which handle or, or what was touched the most the most amount of times during a shift um and it turned out to be things like changing rooms um and you've had things like um your computers on the shop floor so we, the, the the operators on the shop floor would be using to print out pallet labels you've got a mouse there and you've got several people are all coming and using the same keyboard so we just identified those areas um, and we ended up with 10 at each at each of the sites and uh, so what we've now done we've now inbuilt that into into our monthly sort of um, environmental swabbing program because they're, they're not they're not cheap but in this in this um this climate you know cost isn't 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 everything okay thank you for that I and mean, there's another one um in relation to your presentation um you mentioned that you um took part in a third party audit um how did you find that as a technical manager in industry and how did the sites um sort of meet that and do you think it's going to continue post pandemic for a while i, th I think it will um so we, we do we do another audit on monday um at one of the sites um the, the audits went went really well actually i think yeah. um, we, we set everything out we we had clear communication lines of communication with the actual auditor not just with an audit body so we were able to speak to the auditor um at least 10 days in advance to discuss with them um and then when they arrived on site it was really important that we knew where they'd been if they'd been potentially exposed to any any high risk areas um any localized lockdowns for example uh, and th things like that, any any sort of high risk um, industries such as you know the, the, the meat industry at that time was was going through going through problems, um, but it, it worked it worked actually really 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 well. Um, I think where we've moved on to now we've moved on to things like mandatory masks. So any any visitors, including auditors, now come on the site, we would request them to wear a mask all the way through the process, not just on the on the shop floor. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, could I ask you to mute your microphone now, please, Gareth? And please, could I ask Steve from Rowan Foods to um, unmute if possible? Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Steve. I've got a couple of questions, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Um, 
Obviously, we've seen in the news um, the last couple of weeks, COVID-19 measures are increasing. Um, what are you doing as a business at the moment to reinforce your control measures? Uh, to reinforce control measures? Um, we, we, we continue with our works council. That's, that's mm -hmm. key, we see. Um, we're upgrading the social distancing champions. And and we've got we've got uh, we, we, Steve Meller, our, our our sort of social distancing champion, the the, the, we, the supervisor. So we made it an actual department. He's going around and training everybody. So he's got he's put it together mm -hmm. a training pack. He's going around and, and talking to people. Um, I think the biggest thing is probably through the through through the works council, weekly works council, and we're feeding back both the information from the from the, from the government, from what we're seeing, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, and, and trying to persuade people to do the, the right thing outside of outside of work as well, because that's a, 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 a big a big issue. Um, and then, like everybody else, we we we're sort of going through the mask thing and stopping and, and limiting visit uh, uh, visitors and that type of thing as well. So it's it's obviously getting ready for the for the sort of next wave because it's clearly yeah. coming. And sort of like on, on the shop floor as well, what have you found that the best method is, best methods to encourage staff um, behaviours and encourage social distancing rules on the shop floor during a busy working environment and shift patterns? Um, I, think, I think it is the social distancing champions. They, they are walking around continuously talking to people um, and, and, and just with the screens that we've got up and just persuading people. It's, 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 it's actually just getting people to do the right thing themselves. That's, that's the key. They've got to take resp personal responsibility and we've got to try and persuade people, making sure that they're, they're, wear, they're wear, wearing visors, wearing them properly. It's just reminding people. It's not about, it's not about sort of being sort of uh, uh, kicking people necessarily. It's just reminding people as they go through the, the changing room that they wash their hands, all those types of things. It's, 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 it's the basics. It's nothing, we're not doing anything particularly special. We're doing similar to, to what the, 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 the sort of previous, we, we've done the swabs and everything, those types of things as well, because that helps with uh, sort of getting the message over to people, you know, communicating that information back to, back to everybody that, that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it, it's, it's, here to, it's here to stay and we've got to, we've got to, we've got to come up with a, a resolution for it and get through it all together. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for answering those questions. Can I ask you to mute your microphone? please now and if I could ask John O'Farrell from Kikalon to unmute if possible please. Go ahead. Hi John, thanks for joining us um, this afternoon. Um, I've just got a further question or two for you if that's okay. Um, obviously coming into the winter period now, um, what additional controls have you or are you going to be putting in place um, for the winter period with protecting staff um, and ensuring um, needs met for health and safety? There's very little more we can do than we've currently done all spring. Um, it's, as I said, we're vaccinating for the flu. Mm. I would imagine that the next thing I'm going to have to do, again, because we're a small site, is look at the social welfare payments. If we have somebody that is legitimate out and they're on £94 from the government for the two weeks, we've got to top it up. There's no point in thinking we're going to get people that are generally speaking on low income or on tight earnings to take the time out if they feel financially that they haven't got enough food to put on the table for their family. So I think that's going to be a huge issue for us because there's no point in thinking otherwise. You know, there's a £500 grant for the two weeks. That will help some, whether we're, we were entitled to it or not, another question. But I think we genuinely have to pay and keep the people going that are out for that 14-day period. Because otherwise, you're going to encourage people to lie. And that's hugely important to us that they realise we will look after them while they're out. Yeah. No, thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Rhiannon. Thank you, Rhiannon, and our speakers for sharing your thoughts on the, on those questions. I think we have we may have a few more questions that haven't been answered, uh, but we will um, report back to you on that and ensure that we answer all of the questions. So finally, it falls to me to wrap up our session today and say a few thank yous. So firstly. I'd like the speakers, so I'd like to say thank you to the speakers for sharing their experiences and taking part in the Q&A. We agree, greatly appreciate your time and contribution today.
Secondly, all those in the Food Innovation Wales team who have contributed to coordinated Sport is today's events and support our, our industry in Wales. Finally, all of you who have attended today's session, thank you. We hope you have found it useful and will be implementing something from today's session in, all, in your businesses going forward to make them even more COVID resilient. We will ensure you have access to copies of today's presentation uh, for your reference. Thank you to Project Helix. Um, and the UK Association of Food Protection for supporting the event this afternoon. And I would encourage you all to contact your regional food centre for support. The details can be found on our Food Innovation Wales website and obviously it's on the slide now. So I hope you've all in, in, um, enjoyed today's session. Um, we're happy to uh, facilitate more sessions in the future. So like I say, please contact us and um, thank you very much.